Welcome to Pentecostal Preaching Channel. Please subscribe to the channel if you enjoy what you see. Hit the bell to be notified when something new is uploaded. Have a great day. We look at verse 10. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord said unto him out of heaven, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, He's already got his hand stretched up. Here I am. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest him. Wait a minute. He said, Now I But he already said before the boy was born, I know him. And why did he say, Now I know? Did God lose track in the meantime? No. You know what really happened? God knows the end from the beginning. He didn't take Abraham up there and lay Isaac on the wood to prove anything to God. God already knew before Abraham and Sarah had a baby that they would raise their boy to follow God. He already knew that. Why would he say, now I know? Why would he say this? You understand my problem? Everybody still here? Yeah. And he said, For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. I'm going to come back here in just a minute. I'm going to take a little break here, just for a minute. And I'm going to come back and explain to you what is the difference in I know him and now I know. If I can do that for you today, in just a minute, we're going to stand up and stretch here just a minute, take a little break, but when I come back, I'm going to show you that. Then I'm going to get into a very powerful subject concerning the wheel of God. Amen. Would you stand with me, please? Yeah. Shove your Bible back a little bit. Get a little room. Don't, don't go away. I'm, we're not going to be going along. Now, when we finished our session just a few minutes ago, we were talking about and discussing the paradox of God knowing or having relationship with Abraham. And I'm drawing this comparison, as you remember, between the 18th chapter where God says, I can't go down and destroy Sodom and Gomorrah until I talk to this man who feeds me. Okay? And so he says, can I do this thing? Can I hide this thing? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a mighty nation, a great and mighty nation, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him that he will command his children and his household after him. Now I've gone to the 22nd chapter where God literally makes Abraham take his son to the mountain to offer him a sacrifice. And when he lifts his knife and gets ready to slay his son, the angel of the Lord says, Abraham, Abraham. He uses the double enunciation of deity. He takes over both the heavenly and the earthly position. He literally brings heaven and earth together and says, Abraham, Abraham, Saul, Saul, Samuel, Samuel. Truly, truly, verily, verily, peace, peace. Abraham, Abraham, what do you do? Covenant. Boom. God's going to cut covenant. Well, anytime God makes covenant, he takes over both the heavenly and the earthly positions, the two immutable things in the which God cannot lie. God's not lying now. He says, Abraham, Abraham, don't put your hand against the boy. Lay not thy hand upon the lad. Aren't you glad Abraham heard God the second time? Because the first time God said, kill him. The second time God says, don't kill him. Come on, help me now. I don't think we got that. Maybe we just need to stop here. I don't know if we got that or not. What I'm trying to say here is, if we don't hear the progressive revelation of God, we will kill the seed. Because God takes the opportunity to use the very thing that will bring us life to prove whether or not we will obey His voice. That's the whole thing. Now, he says, listen to this. This really gets me here. 
Don't lay your hand on the boy. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thine son, thine only son, from me. Now when did God know? That's what I want to ask you. Look up here at me. When did God know Abraham? He knew him from the beginning. Did God have to take Abraham up to that mountain and tell him to kill his boy so he could lift his knife and then God say, Stop. Now I know that you fear me. Did he do that for himself? Who got the benefit of the mountain experience? Abraham. God didn't need to know. But Abraham, in his realm of human ability to obey, had to manifest his obedience to God by some sacrificial circumstance before he knew that God knew that he knew. What it really did was it made Abraham know that God knew what Abraham knew. If there is no human endeavor, faith is imperfect. As long as faith is in the heavenlies, as long as faith is spiritual, there is no perfection in faith. The Bible says, consider Abraham's works, that his faith was made perfect by his works. He already had the faith. It was when he lifted the knife and said, I'll do it. That he knew. Now I know. It's not that God just now found that. It became now to Abraham. God's knowledge became now to Abraham. He never told Abraham before the boy was born. He was talking to himself. Shall I hide this thing from Abraham, which I do sing that he will command his children after him? He's not talking to Abraham. He's talking to himself. He never told Abraham what he already knew. He took Abraham up to the mountain, put him through a test, so Abraham would know that God knew what God knew. It was a human situation that made him know what God knew already. That's why it became now faith. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Not faith in the past and faith in the future. But now faith. Only made manifest by your covenant by sacrifice. You say, well, I don't understand why that's so important. It's so important because if Abraham could not have heard the voice of God, he could never have manifested his obedience to God. So if God wanted something from him, he couldn't have heard it. Have I made that point clear? I was standing in the darkened window of my house in Alvarado, Texas, about nine years ago, waiting for the eastern sky to light up. It was dark before dawn, and I was out of bed on a Sunday morning, and standing, and I was weeping looking into the darkness. And I said, God, I want to know your will. I sensed a change in my life. I had pastored for 20 years. I was restless in my spirit. I had seen great things happen. Thousands of people baptized with the Holy Ghost and baptized in water. A great, great harvest in the city. Millions of dollars of facilities constructed and built. Ninety acres of land we owned in the city proper. All of that there. But my spirit sensed that God was hungry for me to do something different. And I thought I'd always be there. I went there and started that work when I was 23 years old. I grew up there. My blood and my life was between the joints and the mortar of every block and those 
enormous buildings and in that great amphitheater in the back that we called Sermon on the Mount where thousands of people would gather on the hillsides down and the lakes were down below and the bridge across to the great drama theater on the other side where we had cultural and historical and spiritual things that we we had the city civic orchestra there we had Shakespeare in the park we had Holy Ghost and Fire out behind there in those properties we had awesome things we did in the community and all of that and yet my spirit was restless and said no 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 there's got to be something more and I'm standing this early morning I couldn't sleep and I said I want to know your will God let me know your will now this is real important to us here today are you all still with me a little bit and I heard the voice of the Lord speak to me. I don't always or often say, I heard God. God told me that. I say, I think the Lord spoke to me. I, I feel like I heard from God. You know, I'm real careful. But I can tell you really for sure that God spoke to me that morning. I thought it thundered. I thought it was, I thought everybody in the house woke up. I thought everybody could hear it. It sounded audible to me. And I heard a voice say, you will never know the will of God until you first perceive the wheel of God. And it stopped my prayer, and my tears were hanging on my cheeks like weird little diamonds that had no place to go. And like, what are we doing here? What is that? I mean, it shut me down cold. You will never know the will of God until you first perceive the wheel of God. And I said, the wheel of God? What is the wheel of God? Perceive the wheel of God. I started thinking about wheels. First thing I thought was a wheel in the middle of a wheel. Or put your shoulder to the wheel. I was thinking about wheels. Eyes within and eyes without. Whithersoever the Spirit went, the wheels went. I ran through my little mental computer of wheels. I'm standing there, my prayer is dead. I mean, I'm shut down cold. I'm sitting. I mean, a minute ago I had a great burden laying on me. Oh, God, I want to know you will. And I... The wheel of God. Wheel. And then it hit me. And the word of the Lord came into Jeremiah saying, Go down to the potter's house. And there I will show you a thing. So I went down to the potter's house as I was commanded. And lo, the potter worked a work on the wheel. Suddenly, the revelation of God burst over me. I understood it from the end to the beginning. I went to the service that morning and I preached the message that took me out of my pastorate and took me away from my church. I preached perceiving the wheel of God. You will never know the will of God until you first perceive the wheel of God. Of God. I've been going through things in my life personally. I've been going through things I'd never encountered as a pastor. I'd never had a rising up in 20 years. And I was struggling with some situations. My honor seemed to be slipping. Things that I used to very quickly and easily be able to handle were being a struggle for me. Things were all topsy-turvy. I was confused. And I was crying out for the will of God. Things got bad. Things got upset. I couldn't believe it. I just, I just never had that in all of those years. And suddenly, I'm in a restlessness. I'm in a nest full of needles. Things are wrong. Things are going bad. Things are not going right. It shouldn't be this way. There's no reason why it's this way today and it wasn't that way last year. There's no change. There's no reason why. And yet, things are all out of shape. And suddenly, it broke over me like a flashing light. The wheel of God. I've been praying for the will of God. How many of you ever prayed for God to show you His will? Come on, be honest with me. Let me see hands. And, uh, uh, almost every one of us. I want to do your will, Lord. There's a scripture that came to me instantly in the Spirit that said, Every son that I receive, or every son that he receiveth, he chasteneth. One translation says, Every son that he receives for service, anybody he ever uses, he chastens. Despise not the chastening of the Lord. Come on now, I'm still in the same thing. Don't get mad when the fire comes. Don't get upset when the river overflows. Come on now. You say, well, it's the devil. No, it's not. It's God. But if you don't know it's God, you're in trouble. 
If you say it's demonic, if you say it's the devil, if you say that Satan is raging against you, and when really it's God stirring the nest, the eagle stirreth up her nest, fluttereth over her young, teareth them up on her wings. What's she doing? She's shaking the rabbit fur out of that thing. She's getting the soft feathers out of there. It's the mama eagle that's shaking that nest. As the eagle stirreth up her nest, fluttereth over her young. So the Lord, the Bible said, did lead Jacob. It gets rough in there. The sticks start hurting. Those little old eaglets, they can't stand it in that nest. The thorns are sticking them. They get up on the edge of the nest. It's God's way of getting you out of that situation and into His perfect purpose. To soar into the heavenlies. To understand the will of God. To see the greater heights of His purpose. But if you don't know it's God, Pastor Kelly, if you don't know God's doing the stirring, if you don't know God is in the fire, if you don't know that God is in the water, we've got a problem. Because he says, you really want to do my... Oh, God, use me. Oh, what a terrible prayer to pray. (laughs) Just do anything you want to do. Man, you're giving him license. I'm telling you what. And what God does is He lets you lay there a while in your puddle of tears. And He says, Oh, God, I want to know you will. He said, Really? <laughs> oh, yes, Lord. Just show me thy will, oh, God. Are you sure? <laughs> oh, God, have thine own way, God. Oh, whatever it takes. Really? Whatever? Oh, Lord. Oh, God, I want your will no matter what the cost. Did you ever pray that? Boy, what a dumb prayer pray. Be careful what you say to God. God's hungry. I'm telling you, God's hungry. If He finds somebody that'll feed Him, He'll take you up on that. He'll sit down and wait till you get it cooked. Because He's looking for someone to obey His voice. He didn't just want the meat and the blood anyhow. He said, I don't want your sacrifices. I wanted you to obey me. All of the blood and the meat was only a manifestation in your theater of operation to allow you to manifest your obedience. It's not that God needs money. You need to give tithe. It's not that God needs your attendance. You need to gather together. It's not that God wants Isaac. You need to know what God knows about you. Yeah. Caught me up short again. <laughs> Hallelujah. And so God listens to you. Why there? You're still down in that little puddle. Oh, God, I want to do your will. Oh, do you really, really? Yes, Lord, I want to do you. Oh, God, just send me anywhere. Do anything. Oh, God, anything. Oh, God. So he gets down, and like the potter, he goes, Wah! and he gets you like a puddle of clay, and he goes, Right on the middle of his wheel. Oh God, deliver me, Lord. Oh God, get me out. I rebuke the devil. See, if you don't perceive that you're on God's wheel, you'll pray against the will of God. If the church doesn't know that God is sending judgment, judgment must first begin at the house of God. He's not going to deal with this world until He deals with us. He's going to salvage the church and then save the world. And here we go, round and round. Everything looks out of shape. Man, it's puking time. Mm. All the people that said they love you, they don't love you no more. Everything you thought was all right is not right anymore. The car you just bought, you just wrecked. The situation. You just finally got that building and just got it, the note down on it and half your people got up and walked out. Now you can't pay for it. How are we doing? 
See, if you don't know, that's God trying to do exactly what you begged Him to do, to use you. If you don't perceive that you're on the wheel, you will pray against the will of God. Get me out of this. Oh, my God. Oh, God, I rebuke the devil in Jesus' name. Ah, Satan gets to behind me. Well, he can't get behind you. You're going around in circles. He'd have to, man, he'd have to get on a motorcycle to keep up with you. And by the time you think it's all over, God just... It's worse now than it was. Oh, my God, deliver me. Oh, God. I'm going to die, oh God. And then, you know, we start saying, Oh God, I'm out of the will of God. Pastor, pray for me. I know I'm out of the will of God. No, you're, you're just trying to get in the will of God. God's not going to use you. He doesn't put anybody in the field. He doesn't put to boot camp. He's not going to have an army untrained. He's not going to have a people without covenant. There's not going to be anything happening without blood. It's going to be sacrifice, so there's not going to be the... People, the saints, gather together my saints, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. But if you don't perceive that it's God working on you, if you don't know it's God dealing with you, if you don't know it's God doing exactly what you begged Him to do, then you start praying exactly the opposite prayer. Get me out of this. Oh God, stop this thing. Oh God, I rebuke the devil. Oh, all of you demons, get out of here. Oh, I plead the blood. Oh, Lord, send the angels. It's funny, but it's truth. It's so true that, you know what? We've got churches full of people that took themselves and prayed themselves off the wheel. And they sit in bewilderment and sometimes in bitterness wondering why they didn't get their ministry fulfilled and why they and they an agitation to the ministry they become critical elders and unmoldable deacons they have talent and gifting so pastors put them into position and they also have a bent in their character because they never were made a vessel of honor because before the master ever got them molded, he doesn't just spin you, then he goes. <laughs> you told him to. Are we doing okay? He puts pressure on us. And then we look around and say, Oh my God, what's happened to me? You're on the wheel. But if you pray yourself off... See, we can name a lot of people, but think about Judas. He didn't understand how a Messiah who can open a blind eye or call a dead man out of a grave can actually make himself subject to the system of the day and be threatened with death. He even offered Jesus. I don't think he ever thought that Jesus could ever be taken. He had the money in his purse. I think he thought it was an easy 30 bucks. Because, I mean, when they take the hold of him, he's just going to kill them all anyhow. So I'll just take the 30 bucks and go to the house. When he saw that Jesus was taken, I mean, it shocked him. When he literally saw that these men can tie his hands up and he's not going to break loose. I mean, this Messiah who can walk on water is beaten and he's got a crown of thorns on his head and he, he's emaciated and he's 
in horrible physical condition. When he saw that he was taken, he repented himself. He said, he went back to the chief priest and said, here, take the money. Give me back the Messiah. Here, take the... He never thought he'd be taken. He never dreamed that actually something that powerful could be subdued by men. He never dreamed that Jesus would actually give himself to the persecutors. He never dreamed that Jesus would actually take a beating. He never dreamed that his hands could be tied. Because he'd already seen the works of God. See, we've already seen what God can do, so it doesn't seem reasonable to us that we have to go through anything. God can deliver me. Praise God. Why should I have to go through this? Because he's going to let you get right up there on the mountain and get your knife up? Because it's part of the thing that proves to you so that you know what God knows about you. And it's going to happen in the arena of your human possibility. That's how he makes covenant. Faith is not just an ecliptical thing somewhere in the heavenlies, off somewhere in an unseen world. Faith is manifested by your works of obedience. If you can't hear his voice, you'll never do that. If you never do, whatever God knew you could be, you will never become. Until you're willing to make a covenant by sacrifice in obedience to God. When he saw that he was taken, he repented himself. He threw down the money when they wouldn't take it. He went out and hung himself, killed himself, committed suicide. And you know what they did with him when they cut him down? They took the 30 pieces of silver because they couldn't put it into the treasury because it was the price of blood, blood guiltiness. And they went out and bought a field called a Keldama which in the Hebrew tongue is called the field of blood. It was a potter's field. A place to bury strangers in. We've got loads of Christians who are just pieces of broken vessels who make up a field where Christ in all his possibility is absent and where all of the human disdain and bitterness and anger and hurt and wound is buried. They sit in our benches. They usher in our aisles. They sit in our boardrooms. Broken, wounded people who did not perceive the will of God. They didn't know it was God making them able to be used. So they took themselves off the wheel, never became a vessel of usefulness, and they're laying in a potter's field somewhere. Judas kissed the door of heaven and went to hell because he didn't perceive that it was God doing the work on Christ. It pleased God to bruise him. He didn't know that. So he couldn't do the will of God. Boy, got you quiet now. Ah. Are you all okay? Now what I've said that for is I'm praying that when we walk out of this conference room today that we won't just have been here listening to somebody teach and talk. This is a different deal. I'm not here just teaching on church government right now. I'm teaching on order, but I'm calling for us to come into spiritual order by repentance and by turning around and by hearing the voice of God. As a matter of fact, let me make a statement here. I think we need to take everything we're doing and put it on trial for its life. I don't think you heard me. I think we need to take everything we're doing and put it on trial for its life. I think we need to say, is that what God told me to do? When I was with you last time, I'm going to ask you to turn one more place with me, if you will. I want you to turn into the book of Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 7. Are you all still okay? Let me see you smile a little bit. Okay. Listen, I'm not trying to make you sad. We're just going to pull down so God can ha- He can use us and cause us to grow. Amen? It came to pass when the king sat in his house, And the Lord had given him rest round about from all his enemies. 
that the king said unto Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwelleth within curtains. And Nathan said unto the king, Go, do all that is in thine heart, for the Lord is with thee. And it came to pass in the night that the word of the Lord came unto Nathan, saying, Go tell my servant David, Thus saith the Lord, Shalt thou build me a house for me to dwell in, whereas I have not dwelt in any house since the time that I brought up the children of Israel out of Egypt, even to this day, but have walked in a tent and in a tabernacle? In all the places wherein I have walked with all the children of Israel, spake I a word with any of the tribes of Israel whom I commanded to feed my people Israel, saying, Why build ye me not a house of cedar? Verse 11. And as since that time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and have caused thee to rest from all thine enemies, also the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee a house. Now, didn't I deal with this a little bit when I was here last time? I want to I wanna talk. Are you still with me? Are we still here? Okay, scoot your Bible back and look up here at me a little bit. I want to see your eyeballs. Okay. We still alive? The, somehow these people back here, about two-thirds of the way back, are brighter than the folks up here. The meatballs have taken over. Over here, it's sausage has got it. We were hollering a while ago. Everybody sitting here now going. No, I know you're listening. And I know it's been a long day, and I'm not going to weary you. I have just a few more minutes here now. I have just a handful of minutes left here. And then we're going to, then we're going to be going home. We have to take this with us. I've got to make sure I obey God here today and finish my task. I have only one day to say these things to you. And if you'll notice, I've stayed on one thing all day. All day long, God is judging His church. He's bringing judgment. It's not to destroy us. It's to save us. So David is sitting in his house. He's got a nice house. He's got a house of cedar. He's all shoved back up on his ivory throne. He's leaning back against a zebra pillow. He's got his arm cocked over here off the side, you know, on this nice little pillow. His toes are dug way down deep in that exotic fur that one of his men brought back from some trip he was hunting on or whatever. And he's looking around at all this beautiful wood. And he sweeps back the tapestry and the curtain on his right hand and looks out the window. And there is God in a flapping tent. Nathan. Yes, Brother Nathan. David here. No, King David. <laughs> oh, it's all right, Brother. No you, no, you don't have to say Your Majesty. No, no, it's okay. No, yeah, ha, ha tamashat to you too, yes. Uh-huh. Yes. Yeah, praise Him again, that's right. Yes. Oh, yeah, hallelujah too, amen, yes. You let him have his way, brother. It's all right. It's all right. Mm -hmm. Glory, glory, glory. Yes. Amen. Hello? Yeah, Brother Nathan. <laughs> no, you don't have to say you match. It's all right. Yeah. I'm just uh, sitting here. As a matter of fact, I was waiting on the Lord. <clears throat> and you know, God spoke to me a few minutes ago. And I have a little something I'd like to talk with you about, Pastor. Could you run over it? Hello? Brother, brother? Oh, he's already gone. I mean. Come in, Brother Nathan. How are you? <laughs> Good to see you, brother. Praise God. Yeah, I love you. Yeah. No, no, that's all right. You didn't mess up my crown. It's all right. <laughs> yes, praise God. Oh, yes. Amen. You too. Yes. Hallelujah. Say, brother, listen. I was sitting here this evening just waiting on the Lord, you know, <laughs> thinking on the goodness of the Lord. And I looked outside, and do you know that God, the God that delivered me from the paw of the bear, the God that delivered me from the roaring lion, 
The God that delivered me when I was a boy from the hand of a giant. The God that has kept me in all my way, gave Ziglag back to me and all of my family and brought all of them, gave me a crown at Hebron, crowned me three times, prophet, priest, and king. The God that has established me on the throne and given me rest from all my enemies. He's living in a flapping tent out there. And it's not right, Pastor. I'll tell you what, I'm going to build God a new church. What do you think about that? Ha! Yeah, Lord! He did whatever good preacher does. Oh. Glory to God. Let him have his way, brother. Every good pastor never turns anything like that down. He says, oh, do all that is in thine heart. Let him have his way. They had their little meeting over with, and Nathan went home, went to bed, and God poked him in the ribs about three in the morning. Oh. Go tell David something. I just did. I just told him to do all that was in his heart. <clears throat> Ow. You go ask him. From the day I brought the people of Egypt, or Israel, up out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, did I ever, 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 Tell them to build me a house. You go ask that rascal. I don't care if he's sleeping in his crown. You get him up and ask him, Did I tell you to build me a house? I want an answer to that. I want to ask you something. Do you think David had a bad heart? Do you think David had a bad idea? You think David was trying his best to be rebellious against God? I think he was trying his best to please God. I think he wanted to do something to help God out. Matter of fact, he wanted to raise God's standard of living up to his own. I live in a nice house. I think God should live in a nice house. See, we measure what we do for God by what we do for ourselves. Oh, Lord, here I go again. Are y'all going to stay with me a few more minutes? I can just feel that videotape frying in there. Just, just cooking. It's bubbling right now. You know where I'm headed, don't you? Because Nathan went back and said, David, God said he never told you to do that. You go tell him that from the day that I brought the children of Israel up out of the land of bondage, until this very day, did I ever go to any one of the fathers of any of the tribes and say, Why build you me not a house of cedar? I never did that. I never. What I did say was I was going to build David a house, and I was going to give him a Messiah for a son. I said I'd build the house. It reminds me of some scripture, except the Lord. Come on now. They labor in vain, the building. I tell you, we've got a jealous Jesus on our hands. And here's what he's saying upon this rock. I will build my church, and the church won't let him. We're too busy doing what we think God wants us to do for him. Because we haven't been listening to the voice of God. So we don't know what God is hungry for. So we look around, see what we've got, see what the other nations do, see what the church down the street looks like, and say, i tell you what I think. Here's what I think we ought to do. And then we plead with God. Oh, God, give us finance. Oh, God, give us people. Oh, God. And really all we're trying to do is to talk God into getting involved with our plan. And the work of God is not the work of God at all. It's what we have devised or determined God should do. And then we try to talk God into getting on our side and helping us do it. Before we do those things, don't you think maybe I ought to find out what he's hungry for? Maybe I need to find out what God really wants before I decide what God needs. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. It's 
said, you go back and tell him I never told him to do that. Now, tradition and religion is the composite of all of the things that we do that God never told us to do. We've got a world of things we're doing that God didn't tell us to do. He never told us to do that. But that's what they do. Who's they? Well, I mean, that's what I was taught. By whom? Well, that, that's the way we always did it. Who's we? Well, that's what... When I went to Bible school... Well, when I... Well, you know, when I was brought up... What did God tell us to do? Well, uh, I don't know. As a matter of fact, very few ministries really know the purpose of their calling. Most of them have patterned themselves after failed ministries somewhere. Or after something God told somebody else to do that looks good, that seems to work for somebody, but isn't necessarily the Word of God to you at all. You can be three blocks down the street, and God may have you doing something absolutely, totally, diametrically opposite of what He tells somebody three blocks up the street to do. He said, well, we're in the same town, we're on the same street. Fine. He tells you to do what He might have you feeding the poor. He might have you cooking 600 lunches a day. The street right down here, right down the street. He may have them working with the drug addicts. He may have somebody right up here working with doctors and lawyers. You say, no, they all ought to be feeding the poor. No, they shouldn't. They ought to be doing what God told them to do. If God told you to do that, then you do it. But He didn't necessarily tell everybody to do that. I need to know the vision of God for my house. It's desperate in this hour that we learn what God's Word is for our setting. What does God want us to be? What people are we to be for His kingdom's sake? What does He want from us? So we've got two things that create idolatry. One is God told us to do things a long time ago. Did I ever talk to you about that brass serpent? Can I talk to you about that for a minute? The snakes are biting those poor people in the wilderness. They're all swole up, big as a poison pup. I mean, Mama reached in to get the baby out of the crib and bam, hit her right on the hand. <laughs> big old scaly, nasty, slick snake. And right down here, he's already bit into the cheek of that little baby. Little old brain frying with all of that terrible venom in it. God speaks to Moses. The people cried out to God. God speaks to Moses, and here's the way it goes. And the word of the Lord came unto Moses, saying, Make thee a serpent of brass, and place it in the midst of the camp. And whosoever looks, I'm paraphrasing, whosoever looks on this serpent will live. Jesus used the illustration. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men unto me. You say, well, why did Jesus liken him being lifted up to the snake? I mean, you know, he's not a snake. No, no, the snake was the problem. This is the end of side one. Please, sinless lamb anymore. He had all of the iniquity of the world in his veins. He had assimilated into his sinless body all of the murder and the strife and the rape and the killing and the cancer and the virus and the AIDS. All of it was in him. And he's lifted up. He is representative of the problem in the camp. It's sin that's killing. He's made sin and hoisted up. It's the snakes that are biting them. They make a brass snake and hoist it up. They turn that little baby's head. If they can just get a little glint of the sun off the side of that brass and it shines in that baby's eyes, suddenly the little thing starts breathing again. That is, all right, Mama's going to be okay. It's wonderful. Praise God. He brought deliverance to us. Oh, thank God for the snake. Who said to do it? Who said to build the snake? Who said to make the snake? He did, didn't he? That wasn't a man's idea, was it? 
Did it work? Was it the right thing? Would people have died if they hadn't obeyed? So they did the right thing, didn't they? 780 years later, Hezekiah comes to bring a revival to Israel and restoration to the temple of God. 780 years later. Let's all say 780 years. He walks into the temple of God. There's the altar of sacrifice. There's the laver of water. We've got to get this place cleaned up and start church again. Right inside the curtain, there's the candlestick. Over there's the showbread. Back there's the altar of incense. And behind that veil, I don't doubt that the glory of God's back there. <laughs> We're going to have a... Ah! What's this? The snake. That brass snake is in the temple. And the Bible said the people burn incense unto it unto this day. 780 years later, they are burning incense to the brass snake. You know what Hezekiah did? He broke it into pieces and he said, It's Nehuspan which in the Hebrew means a piece of brass. It's nothing. Nehustan. It's a piece of brass. What is it? It's something God said to do that they did too long. It was the progressive will of God for the time. It's what God said to do in the crisis. But since they stopped hearing God, they didn't hear the next voice. They just kept doing it and kept doing it. And so now they're getting ready. They've marched around Jericho. Oh, but you've got to think about this. To go around Jericho, they've got to get out of the wilderness, go across the Jordan River. Now, I remember it says, hey, set the priest 2,000 paces out before the people, and they bear the ark of God on their shoulders, and let them go before the camp. And so they go out 2,000 paces, and they're carrying the ark on their shoulders. And when the feet of the priest touch the waters, help me a little bit, what happens? Jordan rolls back. And here comes the whole camp of Israel, almost three million people, bigger than Orlando, the whole thing. And when a garden thrown in. And, yeah, that's all right. I want to make sure we get everybody. And Tallahassee, too. And they come across this Jordan River on dry ground. But when they get the ark set out 2,000 paces, now let's get the, let's get the, uh, let's get the labor. Okay, make sure, have, who's got the altar? Oh, yeah, the Levites over here. Oh, oh. Sons of Levi, do you have the, uh, you got the table. All right, got, got the brass. I know it's a little heavy. Get, get the staves through there. That's right, through the brass. You got it? Okay. Oh, by the way, where's the snake? Okay. Don't forget the snake. We've got to have the snake. Bring it along. All the way across. They're going around and around. Seven times around the city. God's still working with them. He's blessing them. They're carrying all of this stuff around. By the way, who's got the snake? Good, bring it home. Go. Hey, God told us to build that thing. Hey, we've got to obey God. God said it. I'm going to do it. And I'll do it till I die. And that's not all, but my kids will do it till they die. And their kids will do it till they die. And see, that's how we got what we're doing right now. They did it till they died, and they did it till they died. What I want to know is what you learned that you're doing, that you got from whoever you got it from. How much of that was what God said to build, and how much of that was an old revelation that's way out of date and way out of time? Until finally, we've come down to the now. And here we are. We've placed so many crowns and halos over so many man-made things that the church can hardly tell which is the altar of sacrifice and which is the golden serpent. We're having trouble determining where to put incense. Do we need the altar of incense or do we need the brass snake? Right, let's burn a little incense over here too because we want to make sure we make God happy. So they're burning incense to that snake. 780 years. That means at least eight generations, or more likely 16 generations, have lived and died, and they're still in idolatry. They're in idolatry over something God said to do. Uh, I can see you shaking your heads like, 
See, I understand. And that's what I'm doing right now. That's why God is causing us to digress. Digress, digress, digress. The church is going down. You say, that's terrible. Oh, no, that's good. I think I showed you that when I was in Tampa last time. We had pastors and evangelists. And then finally teachers. And then prophets. And we've come down to base zero, apostles. What does the apostle do? He takes us to the foundation. We've got to get down to structure. We've got to get everything out of the way. Why have we had to come down? Because we're totally out of order. It's the progression. We progress the digression. We wound up with prophets and apostles. God has taken that which is last and said it first. The thing that God's speaking in the church right now is get back to basics. Get right back to foundation. Start over again. Pray. Put everything on trial for its life. You need to pray over the prayer meeting. Pray over the Sunday worship service. Pray over the music ministry. Pray over the nursery. Did God tell us to do that? We need to put everything on. If it's not right, then don't let it live. But it takes courage to do that. Sometimes the fire burns all around us. When the mighty storm Andrew came through your fair state, tore a path more than 30 miles wide across the end of this peninsula. My wife and I had personal interest particularly my wife, because her mother and stepfather lived in Homestead. And they had two condominiums there, and they were both utterly destroyed. They lived only two miles or so from the Air Force base. So the eye of that terrible storm went right through their house. And they were in it. They didn't leave. God miraculously preserved them. They ran from one room while it collapsed to another, while it was blown away and into another. And finally, under an old roll-top desk, Linda's mother, who is a sweet, sweet Catholic lady, she laid under there crying, Jesus have mercy, Jesus have mercy, with a big pillow beside her head, while that storm roared like a freight train, blew their house away right off the top of them. And they never got a scratch. Amen. Jesus have mercy. No time to talk to Mary. No offense. No offense. It's just... Let's go to the man right now. Oh, yeah. Hey, her mother said, I just knew I was going to die. All I could think of is Jesus. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's what, you know, we need to get back to that kind of simplicity. I'm, I wish all of us were Catholics again, coming back to God. It's a shame we've been Pentecostals and Charismatics and whatever for so long. Methodists and Episcopalians and Baptists. We've got so much denominationalism hanging on us. We've got so many grave clothes swinging off us. We don't know what's God and what's not. We don't know what's denomination and what's Holy Ghost. We don't know anymore. We don't know what God said to do and what men are saying to do. We got out at the Miami airport just two days. Man, there were trees laying on cars at the airport, 30 miles north. I couldn't believe the devastation there. We finally got a rent car. They couldn't even clean it. They didn't have gasoline to put in it. We had to hope we could find gasoline. And when we finally started driving down the turnpike, man, oh man. Whew. When we started down that way, down through Cutter, Cutler Ridge and... I was so shocked, I couldn't believe it. How many of you have been down that way? You've seen some of that devastation. I just, oh. I mean, the news media doesn't even get close to telling us what happened there. There's still people down there without power, without homes, without any place to live. It's still intense. Probably will be for a year. They say that it's the greatest natural disaster in the history of this nation. Yeah. And you know what's astonishing to me? That less than 30 people died. More people died last week in the snow than died in the greatest natural disaster in the history of this nation. I was on the way down. I began to weep. And I said, God, what does this mean? Instantly the Holy Ghost spoke to me and said, Once more will I shake the heavens and the earth. I mean, it shocked me. I almost let go of the wheel. I'm sitting there looking at all this. And then I said, what does that mean? And the Lord said, you see this manifestation in your arena of understanding? That's what I am feeling in the heavenlies. 
All that's happened down here is nothing but a manifestation of the turmoil and it shall be very tempestuous round about him. Fire shall burn before him. What are you saying, God? I'm going to do it one more time. I'm going to shake everything that can be shaken. And the things that cannot be shaken will remain. Brother, if you've got too much worldly things, too many natural things, too many human things, not enough God things, God's going to take you down to the foundation. You say, that's horrible. No, it's wonderful. Because when he gets through with that, we're truly going to be the people he thought we could be. He knew it before he tested us. He knew us before we go through it, that we could make it. He knew we could make it. He knew we could stand it. He won't put more on you than you're able to bear. He knows ahead of time what you can take. He knows your tensile strength. He knows your ability to stand. When I got down there standing knee deep in sheetrock and insulation and broken glass, and you could look up and see the sun, look out and see the outside. I mean, it was just blown to pieces. When I stood there, I said, you know, we're looking for little stuff like wedding albums, things you could never replace. And little old bitty brass shoes that belong to little girls that are now 40 years old and things like that. You know, I'm sitting around looking in this stuff and digging in this pile of mess and I'm sitting there thinking, my God, how can this happen in less than 30 people die? And the Holy Ghost spoke to me one more time and said, I did not send the wind to destroy the remnant of the people. I sent the wind to destroy the structure. And God said, I'm going to do it to the church. Thus was born this burden in my spirit that I brought to Orlando with me. God's going to shake the church. When you see ministers coming, it's not just the devil. God is saying, no. No. Get rid of the phoniness. Get rid of the flakiness. Get rid of the hypocrisy. Get rid of the religiosity. Hearken to my voice one more time. Listen to me once again. I think we need to start praying, God, take away from me everything you never told me to do. So our idolatries are created from two things. The things God told us to do that we do too long without a new voice in progressive revelation. And the things God never told us to do that we do as though they were the things God had ordained for us to do. You say, well, you're leaving me in pain. I don't want to do that. I just want to leave you in great desire. God, if you ever get hungry, please tell me. If you ever get thirsty, would you please let me know? I'm going to get ears that can hear. If it takes fire, I want eyes that can see. If it takes wind, I want a heart that can understand. More than anything else, I am so divinely discontented. I want God more than anything else in all the world. This message has been brought to you by Mark Canby Ministries.